Good morning, everybody. It is Wednesday, May 20, May 20. Um, welcome to Change the Shed. I hope you're doing well. Um, it's summer here all of a sudden, so <clears throat> might be warm where you are too. That's good because we can go outside. Um, I thought maybe at the top I should do a little recap of why I do change the shed, um, mostly for myself, sort of an intention thing. Um, I counted this morning how many of these I've done now, and I have now forgotten. Uh, it was something like 26. So that's fun. And I started this on the first day that Colorado had their safe at home order and or stay at home order. And now they're calling it safer at home. Um, and I am here to just provide some encouragement to weave. So the purpose of the Change the Shed for me was not about teaching or even really imparting information. It's just welcoming you into my studio and um, convincing myself to do some weaving and hopefully convincing you to do some weaving. So I just wanted to recap because I think... Um, uh, in some places that I don't know if I've lost sight of that, but a few people seem to not have gotten that sort of message. So that is why I'm here. I hope that you all are weaving and you're having a great week so far and um, welcome from all over, um, all over the country, all over the world, Europe. Um, I believe it is evening in Europe, so, so good evening. Um, Vancouver and Grand Junction and Pittsburgh and um, Texas, where it is supposed to be almost 100 today. Wow, Christine. I think it's supposed to be almost 85 here in northern Colorado at 5,000 feet elevation. Um, pretty warm for May. Doesn't usually get quite that warm here this early. Um, and New Mexico and California and Maryland and Connecticut and San Francisco Bay, um, Florida. So glad you all are here. Um, Laura got to go back to work. I think that's probably good news. Um, Whidbey Island. Oh, wonderful. <clears throat> Jocelyn, that's so awesome. The first fawn of 2020 is a fun thing. Did it have spots? I love um, being out hiking and coming across. This has only happened to me a couple times, but I've come across um, a baby fawn that the mom has left to um, go feed. And the fawn, just they just um, curl up and hope you don't see them. And of course, I, you have to um, go the other direction quickly because you don't want to endanger them. But that's a wonderful thing to see. Um, okay. You all are wonderful. So glad you're here, New Brunswick. From New Brunswick to La La Land. I like it. Um, Wisconsin and Phoenix. Only 72 in Phoenix. That's kind of cool for you guys, Deborah. Um, cool. Hello, everyone. Santa Rosa, Chattanooga. Um, anyway, yeah, this shirt is May the Forest Be With You. So I should have worn this on Star Trek, Star Wars Day. Wow, I, that was, uh, sorry, you Trekkies. Um, Star Wars Day. This is clearly a reference to May the Force be with you. So Star Wars Day is May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. Um, anyway. Um, yes. So thank you all for coming and thanks for your comments about um, coming for Weaving Encouragement. That is why I am here. Also, of course, we all are going to learn stuff. We're going to learn from each other. And why else would we... Um, show up. Learning from each other is a fabulous thing. I am still working on this little... Actually, if you were here on Monday, you'll notice that I have done virtually nothing since Monday on this piece, but 
that's all right. I've been working on a few other things. This is one of those um, epic yarns that <clears throat> is dyed in uh, not evenly. I don't know if you can see that. Let's see. Can you see how it's slightly uneven in the dye? That's done on purpose. So that, see, it's lighter here and then darker. Um, this is that epic yarn that's from Portugal, made in Portugal. It's sold in the United States, I think. <clears throat> now I'm get. I, it must be Washington. Now I'm second guessing myself that, oh, maybe it's in Canada now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Whatever. Someone will look it up and let us know. There are, um, in case you're new, if I mention something that, um, a yarn or a tool or something, there's a, this website page that's right there. There. <laughs> um, change the shed, RebeccaMessoff.com, change the shed. I'm putting links to things. So if I mention something, there's probably a link to it there. If I remembered anyway. Oh, that's the wrong direction. See, and sometimes when I'm doing the point of a triangle here, and sometimes when I do that, I have to do it twice, three times to get it to weave right. So um, I want it to do a hill thread over that. This is a valley thread, and I want it to wrap around it so that it will weave correctly and have to get it going in the right direction to make that happen. This looks like it might be a funky shape because I didn't didn't quite plan that well. I hope you all are um, weaving something wonderful today. Nope. Again, your my brain is figuring out how to get this going in the right direction. So one conversation I've been having in a couple of different classes, it's weird how stuff comes around all at the same time um, for people, entirely different people. And I see it because I see all the classes, the online classes, but um, that the same question will come up in multiple in multiple classes is really interesting to me. Sometimes it's because I see it on like the Facebook group or something, but other times it's just, I think it's random. Anyway, this question about um, shedding and how to make your yarns show up in the right sheds when you're adding shapes or something. The most recent thing we were talking about was about, um, in one class was about starting, building up shapes and starting things in the right shed. Um, and... I'm just testing this to see if. Um, anyway, I would I would just like to say that um, if I have given the impression or you get the impression from watching other tapestry weavers that they always just start a yarn and it all works out, that is not the case, at least not for me. Um, you do get much better at knowing automatically which direction the yarn needs to go in and which shed, but... Um, Especially for if I'm starting something on a point. Sometimes I have to play with it a few times. And as you, um, as you weave, you will um, see that things change. So a shape will drop out. You'll add another color. It's always shifting. So you always have to adjust your shedding, always. It's not that you're doing it wrong. It's that that's the nature of the beast. I just want to reassure those of you who, I do not like this shape at all. You know what? For the moment, I'm just going to go with it. Okay, so one thing, um, I 
One thing that I meant to show you on Monday that I forgot, we were talking last week about John Moss's bobbins. And this is the one John Moss bobbin that I have. And it's gorgeous. Um, just he does such a beautiful job with the points of the bobbins and the wood is, is really beautiful. So I just wanted to show you that as compared to a lot of the little bobbins I'm using are like this. They're much thinner for small looms. But the John Moss bobbins are will hold much more yarn, and they're really pretty. There's a link to his website um, on that page. And John Moss is a master of bobbin making. This is a, I'm looking at this and thinking, wow, that's a really poorly wrapped bobbin there. I don't remember what that yarn was from. Um, so... Ah, Summer, that's sweet. She says she took a day off to watch me. That's no no pressure there, Summer. I hope you took a day off to like go and sit in the sun or take a walk or do some weaving or do something fun. Um, thanks, Marlena. That's really, really sweet. Um, I also like it when the yarn is dyed unevenly. Oh, Janet says she thinks it's sold in L.A. We're talking about this epic yarn again. Um, uh, Timeless-Textiles is their website. And so maybe it is the U.S. Um, oh, thanks, Karen. She says she just ordered my book. So that is, it comes out in October, and I know I've talked about the book way too much on Change the Shed, but um, I happen to be in the middle of the last edit of the book. I'm on, it has 15 chapters and I am just starting chapter eight today. And any of you who have written books, which I know many of you, several at least of you here have, have written books. Um, you might have advice for me about the last. So they send you the whole book and it's the last time in my head anyway, the last time I ever get to see it before it shows up in print and I can't change it. So I am dealing with my own demons about that, about wanting to change absolutely everything. A friend of mine who's written a couple books told me that um, you only get to change things that are egregious errors. So I have in my head, is that an egregious error or do you just want to change the wording for the 47th time? Anyway, by the time you see me on Monday, I should be done with that, which will be pretty amazing. I think I should have a party. Um, um, Mandy asked if I'm using a cartoon for this and no um, I did have a scribble that um, I was sort of following but I haven't even looked at it lately um, that's hard I'm actually doing that on purpose not using a cartoon um, because it really forces you to and this is just a little sample thing so it doesn't really matter but it really forces you to look at where the shapes are going. If you don't have a cartoon to follow, you have to really use your eye to think about, oh, do I need to move that over? Like if I were going to do this again, I would have moved this little corner up because there's quite a step there. I would have moved that up one or two more. So it looked more like that. So there was more of a diagonal. I would have not moved that over so fast. With a cartoon, I might have seen that quicker. I don't know, but um, cool. Um, so much. You guys are doing, Dana's working on the James Kohler join, and some of you are working on new headers, and... Yes, Jessica, just to clarify, I am doing, I'm building up shapes. I'm not weaving line by line. It, when I'm doing something like this, I am deliberately working on seeing things in shapes. And also, I don't have any hatching or anything going on in here. If you're doing color shading and stuff, sometimes line by line is really necessary. But um, for small things like this, I almost always build up shapes. And it's really a fun um, challenge to train your brain to see things this way. I want this to curve. See? And that's another thing that I'll do is like, well, I want this really to curve like this. So I moved that over too soon. So I'm going to back it up. Um, 
I think I need this one on the edge to go over. More like this. This needs to go up farther. Um, thanks, McKenna. That's nice. I'm glad that watching, um, that is actually one of my goals and one of the reasons I did this, that watching someone weave it can be really helpful. Um, so I'm hoping that that is encouraging. Not that the way I weave is always correct or anything like that, but um, I also have found if I'm ever able to go into someone's studio, I, if I can convince them to weave, I will stand and watch them as long as they will do it because you learn so much. You might learn something that you don't want to do yourself, but um, I think it's really helpful to see different procedures and how people accomplish what they do. Let's see. Can you see that? I think my camera is, again, like focusing in and out, which I apologize for. If I, maybe, if I leave, if I set the focus so that it doesn't change, then I can't move it up and down, but um, it might be better than having it switch all the time. You'd think 26 episodes in, I would have figured out how to make the camera work work best, but. Um, oh yeah, Devra. Um, yeah, definitely don't feel bad about um, the shedding problems. It's totally normal. Every uh, It's harder when you're starting out because you don't see as easily how the sheds are working. So it can be challenging, but don't feel like that will, like you'll just know at some point, you it's a trial and error process in my world anyway. Um, Audrey, um, sometimes I'm laying the yarn in and other times I'm twisting it. The twisting comes from a habit I've developed from using a different yarn, the um, Harrisville Kohler Singles or the Faru yarn, which I like having twisted. This is a plied yarn. Those are singles yarn. So they're just one strand that is not plied. This yarn is plied. It's a two ply yarn. And so twisting it doesn't, it doesn't lie as well. Mostly the twisting I'm doing is unconscious because it's become a habit for a different yarn. Um, in this case with this yarn, I found that I like it better if I don't twist it, which is interesting. It's just how the yarn is behaving. This is that yarn I'm testing for um, gist. Um, I think this needs to go up again. So always, this is so common with curves, I think, and some of the rest of you probably have experienced this or can speak to it, that when you're making a curve that goes vertical, like say you're making a circle, it's so easy to make it come in too soon and then you get the egg, you know, the dreaded egg. That's true on any curve. Um, so... Mara says Timeless Textiles is in Gresham, Oregon. In my head, they're somewhere on the West Coast, so that could well be. Um, Angie, it's uh, Timeless Textiles, and there's a link in my on that website. Um, just scroll down a little ways. Ah, Kathy, that's sweet. She's working on weaving projects from Little Looms with her Untangled book open. Um, Stay at home is over in Massachusetts with a soft reopening. Yeah, it's interesting. Lori says that. Um, it's interesting the um, wording that I'm seeing out of different states. So Colorado went to this thing called safer at home, which is, I think, a good way to manage it. They're basically saying, we still need you to mostly stay home, but if you want to go to a few businesses are open, you're allowed to do that with restrictions like masks. Um, but it's interesting just to see how different states are managing. Um, when you're building up shapes, do the lines eventually match? Um, so eventually, and I don't know quite if this is what you're asking, Mandy, but in my head, I'm thinking that this green line will travel around like this. And so uh, I do want them to come together eventually. And this is a point at which a cartoon 
would be a really good tool to make that happen. Um, and so the little masochist in me who wants to train, it's just a training thing, wants to work on being able to see shapes without using a cartoon is doing this. If you've ever seen that picture of Susan Martin Maffei, it might, she has a new website and I think maybe it's not on the website anymore, but there's a picture of a tapestry that she wove that's from her, I think it's from her New York Times series. And it's a tapestry where she, in the picture she's sitting, the tapestry's on a scaffold loom and it's a huge loom. It goes all the way to the ceiling of her apartment and it, um, the so the, the tapestry doesn't roll. The tapestry's about seven feet high, maybe. It's something like that. It's really tall. Anyway, the pictures of her sitting on a, on another piece of scaffolding um, at the very top of the loom working on the end of the piece. So the, a bunch of those pieces, and I think that was one of them, um, she wove the entire piece with... It's a, it's a realistic picture of someone reading a newspaper. There's a little kid in the picture, and there's a newspaper and a cat, and um, it's like a realistic place. She wove that piece without a cartoon. Um, so that's the thing in my head about, oh, if you practice, you know, if you practice any skill, you will get better. So that's part of my my wish to practice um, weaving things sometimes without cartoons. Not that I will necessarily do much woven work in general without a cartoon. It's just a... You know, it might look kind of like a flower if I leave this shape. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was supposed to be another leaf shape, but I really didn't hit it on this one. Um, oh, Paula, that's a great question. You're gonna get an opinion from me if you ask that. Um, so just take this in stride, those of you who Maybe don't agree with me on this, but Paula's asking, do I always build a curve from the bottom up? She's seen YouTube videos by weavers making wall hangings who use a sumac curve first and then fill in underneath. My opinion on that, I will try to be brief because um, no one wants to hear a bunch of opinionated uh, stream of whatever, but tapestry is a structure that is built from the bottom up. It's built like bricks. You start at the bottom, you create a firm foundation, and you always weave on top of what's below. If I put in, so what Paula's asking is, say I want a circle up here. What if I weave this circle in first and just let it hang out up here on the warp and then go back and fill this in underneath? Um, that is how a lot of people on YouTube are teaching tapest tapestry weaving. That was air quotes. Um, see, there's my opinionated nature coming out, and I don't want to discourage people from weaving in any form. It's just, I consider it a different form of weaving. It's, and they are mostly making weft-faced weavings, but it's pretty hard to get the structure to actually be weft-faced when you do that. Um, it's gonna be looser. You're not gonna be able to get a firm structure that's gonna hold up well over time. Also, a lot of those people are using materials that are very transient, like roving. If you weave roving into something, how are you going to clean the dirt off of it? How are you going to keep it together over time? Um, it, that might not matter. It might be a transient art piece, and that's awesome. But um, I am teaching tapestry in the form of, you know, European traditional sort of built from the bottom up kind of tapestry. So no, I would never do that. Um, also, oh, the last point I was thinking of was if I have a shape up here and I'm, so, you know, say I've woven something up here and to fill in underneath, there's no shed. So everything I weave here will be with a needle. Um, again, which means it's very hard to get your weft tension correct and it's hard to get it to actually look weft faced because um, you won't be able to get the right amount of weft in there. Um, and and also it's going to be hard to make your shapes the way you want them because everything is moving all the time. I just think it's a really poor idea in terms of how to create a stable textile. Um, also, sumac doesn't hold. So if they're using sumac around a shape to hold it in, that seems weird to me. I have done things with open warps, not very much, but other people have done lots of stuff with open warps. That, that's fine, it's, it can be a gorgeous thing to do, but 
I think most of them use uh, double half hitch knots to keep the weaving structure from coming apart. One thing that I need to explore more. So if you have never seen Robbie LaFleur's blog, um, L-A-F-L-E-U-R, she studies Norwegian tapestry weaving and she lives in Minneapolis and teaches there a lot. Um, she just had some recent pieces that had tons of open warp and they're fascinating. And when I look at them, I don't think that there's any knots holding the forms together. So that is something that I would like to explore further in terms of how did she do that and why? Um, now I have run into a problem because of no cartoon because I want this to come up and around and I have not quite built the hill I wanted and I wanted it to come down like this. So some modification may be needed here. I think I'm going to bring this over. Oh, and the other thing I didn't do was sew this slit, which is something that I intended to do before you saw me today. Um, anyway, Paula, that was my opinionated response. Um, for all you wall hanging weavers who are watching this, you just go knock yourselves out, but consider weaving from the bottom to the top as a way to make a more lasting uh, structure and a freaking easier way to weave. Like if I can't open my shed, so it makes it so hard to weave. Um, ooh, Ellen, I don't know what I said. The dreaded something. That makes me think of the Princess Bride and the dreaded R-O-U-S. <laughs> Sorry. Isn't it weird what your brain will do? Um, cool. So... Um, Oh, I think I learned that from you, Sarah. So Sarah said when she is working without a cartoon, she likes to air trace it on the warp. So what I was doing like this, um, I'm pretty sure I learned that from you, Sarah. I took a class. It was an American Tapestry Alliance retreat from Sarah Sweat. Um, was it 2015? Uh, it was in Golden, so near where I live, maybe 2016. It was one of those years. Um, and it was about weaving vertical curves. And so I learned a lot about how to do this from Sarah. And one of the things she's demonstrating was that, oh, if I trace it like this in my head, I can figure out where it goes. Um, I've backed myself into a corner here because now I would like it to go up farther, but I put this element in. So we're just gonna go with it and see what happens. Experimentation. Oh good, Summer, I'm glad you thought it was a flower. It's all, it's definitely a hanging flower. I mean, come on. I should have put a little, oh, I could do that with a needle, a little um, tiny bit of yellow right at the tip. That would fix it. Definitely. Um, cool. Um, that's true, Janet. So we, when I was talking about um, the visual thing about making circles and how um, we often move them in sooner than we should and they pack down and make eggs. The other thing, of course, in tapestry is that things compress as you weave and they will also pack down even more. And if you're using cotton sand twine, it will shrink when you steam it. So it will sh pack down even more. So when you're making round, perfectly round circles, if you ever do such a thing, make them way taller. Make them an egg in the upright direction. Um, make the sides way longer than you think they should be. And then with the packing down, like Janet's saying, and the shrinking, um, they might be circular. I try to avoid perfect circles because they're very hard to get exactly right. Um, no problem, Paula. I appreciate the question and I do hope I didn't sound too opinionated. I do have reasons for those opinions, but... Um, I also think that any way you want to weave as long as you're weaving, you should totally do it. Like just getting your hands in materials and making stuff is so important. And so if you want to weave stuff right in the middle of your warp and fill in around it with a needle, knock yourself out. Um, cool. Um, so yeah, bottom up weaving. Um, so, um, and that partly, I, that partly comes from Archie Brennan. Um, he has several videos where he's talking about this and I'm going to put those 
links to those in the design class. Those of you who are in the design class, that that information will be all linked and stuff. But you can find a lot of it on YouTube if you Google Archie Brennan. Um, he talks about tapestry being a journey up the warp, which I love. Um, and also that um, it's built like bricks. So you start at the bottom and you go upwards and um, built like bricks, journey up the warp. Those are the two, my two Archie Brennan um, quotes in my head. Nope, that's not what I want. This. Archie, unfortunately, for us, passed away last October. But I hear that the folks, the good folks in Edinburgh, he is Scottish, are putting together a retrospective show of his work. And I'm so excited about this. If there's any way I can get to Edinburgh, if we can travel again, it's supposed to be next year, so. Okay, I'm just gonna throw this in here. Oh, look at that, my shed's all worked out. I'm just gonna throw this in here to look at it. So here's another thing sometimes that can be helpful is you just put something in to see what it looks like. Hold on. Let's put this in the back so it's not in the way. I am going to make that more of a curve, but it helps me sort of see how it's going to go. And so that tells me that I don't like how this moved over right here. And maybe even this one needed to go up a little bit higher. That one there. Um, just a process of your brain looking at it. It's like learning to draw, but you're drawing with yarn. So like your brain learning to interpret the shape and make it change the way you want it to. Comes with practice, y'all. I hate to tell you. Or I like to tell you. Comes with practice. Okay, I'm going to go back here because I think this one needed to go up one more. That might be enough. Um... Good job, you guys. Great. Morris, yes, the circle squish thing is real. Any shape. Um, what Janet was reminding me of was that, yes, when you beat, I mean, we're constantly beating and the stuff starts to compact lower down. And so any shape you do will compact at least somewhat, depending on the materials you're using. So that's always a consideration in terms of if you need a very precise shape, making it a little bit longer so because it will pack in. Um, Yay, Nancy, for finishing your convergence piece for the, um, I'm sure that you, maybe you're talking about the renditions show. Um, I was way late with, well, the one that you saw last week, the hot flash piece was supposed to be for renditions and it's not even done yet. So um, no shame in that, no shame. Eventually you build up enough pieces that you can pull one out from the closet that you haven't exhibited anywhere and send that in. So that can be a goal, like get to the point where you have enough pieces stuck in your little um, closet that are finished or unfinished that you can pull one out for when someone needs one for a show. Um, oh, Jessica, no, I won't be working with Susan on the show in Edinburgh of Archie stuff. I don't, I'm not even sure that Susan is, um, I'm, I'm sure she's assisting with it, but I think that the folks in Edinburgh are putting all of that together. I was not a student of Archie's. I never had the privilege of, of studying with him. I know that some of you here studied with him a lot. And so you are much more, um, you have much more knowledge about Archie's teaching than I do, but there is some really fun stuff you can see on the internet. And he and Susan are still, um, well, Susan, Susan was Archie's partner for many decades, since the 80s, I think. 
And she is an amazing tapestry artist. Please go look at her new website. It's gorgeous. Susan Martin Maffei. I'll put the link in the thing in the, um, on the website. But um, yeah, I lost my rabbit. Anyway, I'm sure she sent all kinds of archival materials for the show. But um, definitely, I would not be the person to be helping with Archie's show. I just really want to see it. Um, yes, Lynn, I think you're right. Thank you. Lynn is in the UK and she says that the um, retrospective is being brought together by the Dovecot Weaving Studio in the National Museum of Scotland. I think that sounds right to me also. I believe I saw an opening date of March of 2021. So we shall see both if that happens and whether we can go. Those of you in the UK though, absolutely there is I think it'll be like a three month show at least. You have to go, you have to. This is not optional. If you live in the UK, you have to go to Edinburgh to see it. Um, anyway, oh, I know what my rabbit was. <laughs> Isn't that the weird expression? I lost my rabbit. Um, Archie and Susan have DVDs. So they made, um, during the time they were living in New Zealand, for or visiting New Zealand. I think they were doing an artist residency or something in New Zealand. It must have been in the early 2000s or late 90s, something like that. Anyway, they did a whole series of amazing videos and they are still for sale. If you go to Archie, um, I think they're on Archie's website. Uh, just search Archie Brennan and um, you can still purchase those. I believe now they were DVDs. I think they're available for digital download. So that's pretty exciting. Um, if you, they're not, there is some beginning information, but um, they're a little more advanced, but the concepts um, are fantastic. They talk about so many things and it's, they're really, really amazing and they're worth the price. Um, I can't remember what they cost, but it's, I think it's maybe more than $200, but it's also eight DVDs worth of video, so. Um, okay, so I don't know how it's already 11.07, um, but I made a little progress here, and I have a little curve starting to happen, and you all are going to keep weaving this weekend, and um, thanks for encouraging me to keep weaving. Once this book edit is done, I will be, yeah, I always tell you what I'm going to do, and then, you know, who knows what will happen, so I will surprise you. I will do something, and you will see it on Monday. And uh, I will be back on Monday and Wednesday next week. And that's all I know at this moment. Um, yeah. Nan says only digital now. I think that's true. You can't buy the DVD anymore for the Archie and Susan um, videos. Um, I think you can only get it as a download, but I think it's fabulous that they're offering it as a download. It's a lot easier for Susan to manage and... Um, a lot easier for Susan to manage and um, faster for you to get the, the things. And I don't know about your computer, but I haven't had a computer in a long time that had a um, DVD player. So, um, okay. Thank you all for, and hello, Grace. Um, glad you're here. We are about at the end, but the recording will be up in seriously like five minutes after I turn it off. So, um, Nan, I knew someone was going to bring that up. That Aras Loom is on the top of my list. Believe me, it is coming. Um, the new Shacked, Angie, it's the new Shacked Loom. The um, Shacked Aras Tapestry Loom is... Um, I have two new looms that I'm going to be posting on my blog about in the next couple of weeks. So one is the Merrick Saffron, which a lot of you already have and know all about. And the other one is the new Shaft loom, um, which is a big wooden upright tapestry loom. Um, it's not big. It weaves to 20 inches wide. Um, it is really, really pretty. The um, wood, when I pulled it out of the box, the, the Shaft Arras loom, it's some kind of maple or something. The wood is so pretty. Um, I love it. Okay, so now I've entered my chatty stage, and that means it's time for me to, to say goodbye, have a good weekend, weave a whole bunch, go outside in the sunshine if it's warm. Um, I hope there's no 
rain, hurricane events, whether, wherever you are and, um, go do some weaving. And then if you are on Instagram, especially, or other social media, post a picture of what you're weaving with and use this hashtag right there, change the shed. It's really fun to see what everybody is doing. So, um, have a great weekend and I will see you all on, um, Monday, same time, same place.